Hello, everybody. I'm Macy Wyman. I want to thank you all for coming here to listen to us interns talk a little bit about our projects. Um, my project was on the wet meadow restoration that YVSC does. Specifically, it surrounded the monitoring protocol for the success of those restorations in California Park. Um, a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Colorado. My family moved here from the Front Range three years ago, and we've just been loving it ever since. It definitely feels like home now. Um, I'm a wildlife biology major with a minor in rural sociology at Clemson University. So I'm between here and South Carolina, where I'll head back to in about a week. I want to start by thanking my staff mentors who really helped me through this project, specifically Ryan Messinger, um, the Natural Climate Solution Project Manager at YVSC, and Dakota Dolan, the Forest Resilience Project Manager. They really helped me to have all my ideas come to life. Some partners we had on this project was the U.S. Forest Service, the Colorado Crane Conservation Coalition, Rocky Mountain Youth Corps, and Keep Out Wild. They did a lot of the hard labor necessary to make this happen. A little bit of background on my presentation. Wet meadows are a type of wetland that act as a sponge in our landscape by um, storing the water longer in our mountain ecosystem. And they're really important as they're critical to drought resiliency as they hold that water longer in the ecosystem and slowly distribute it to other bodies of water. Um, but part of it that's really important is they also play a positive role in carbon sequestration as most wetlands do. And they're really important to the sage grouse, which are keystone species that have had struggling populations for the past little while now. But thanks to CPW and the US Forest Service, we've seen some positive trends. But since the grouse are really reliant on, um, on these wet meadows, this is gonna be a really key part to getting those populations back up. So how we actually restore these wet meadows is by using Z-dike structures, which is seen here, it's these rock structures, and they work by slowing down the water as it moves through the ecosystem. And as the water slows, it drops the sediment, helping to fill in any degradation or erosion, specifically um, degradation and erosion that is caused a lot of times by wildlife tracks, cattle tracks, or human use of the land. So the project objectives I had were okay. Uh, so my project objectives were my main goal was to develop a monitoring protocol for the wet meadow restoration success in California Park. And the way I was going to go about doing this was by developing a booklet of indicator species and their identification. So these species were able to indicate to us whether or not the wet meadow was thriving because they're dependent on a wet meadow for their own growth. They also, I also created a monitoring protocol with specific steps that could be used if somebody was in the field implementing this monitoring in the future. And so we can get a good idea with the data necessary to understand whether or not we've seen success in these restorations. So some details on these two different um, objectives were in developing my indicator species list and their identification, I first obtained a list by the US Forest Service of all of the plant species present in California Park. To identify, then I identified their wetland dependency. So they were either um, between obligate, obligate wetland species and upland species. And I was specifically focused on the obligate species and the facultative wetland species as I then developed those into my booklet, which is a page of seen here, um, where I listed key characteristics for identifying them so that if somebody was in the field, they could have a little booklet to help their own understanding of what the different plants were, and then they could collect that data, and that would tell us the success of the restoration. Um, and then for creating pro monitoring protocol steps, I did a lot of research um, I specifically researched the BLM from the BLM's database, and they have a lot of information on transect lines and best monitoring protocols in science right now. Um, 
Um, and then I, a key part of it was creating really simple, easy to understand steps that anybody who we had to do this monitoring could do. So that was a lot of like thinking about too, what when I was looking at a plant would actually be helpful to me. Um, so that was the next step. My key takeaways were that natural climate solutions are really important. And I think there's something that are really quickly overlooked. As Chloe was saying, they take a long time and they don't feel like they're that big. But ultimately, I think they are really important. And I think a lot of people can get behind them because they not only restore the land a lot of times and help protect this valley that we really care about, they also bring down the carbon in our atmosphere. And then I think that the next thing I learned was that balancing resources with the depth of detail in our project is really key. So I think that in academia, we a lot of times really overemphasize the idea that like you should have the most depth possible and be collecting the most data you possibly can. And I very quickly learned by coming to IVSC that in the real world, we don't have those resources available to us. So how can we obtain sufficient data so that we can get our objectives done and still be very thorough, but with the resources we have. And then with that, grant requirements were a big thing I learned about. Monitoring is really important to a lot of grants. Um, one of the grants that we have now obtained is the Title II Secure Rural Schools Program. This grant has given us money to continue these restorations, and the NIFWIF Colorado Greater Sage Grouse Fund has accepted our pre-proposal, and we are hopeful to secure more funding from them, and both of those grants required a monitoring protocol to be in the works, if not completely um, implemented by the time they give us that money. So some other YVSC projects that I was a part of during my time here this summer was the Yampa River Forest Restoration Program, which you just heard Chloe talk about. And I specifically was helping her and Ryan with the cottonwood irrigation. Um, and then I attended the Insight Fundraiser, the CAP Open House, and the Yampa Basin Rendezvous, which were all great opportunities to meet people in the local community with the same interests and who I think will help me moving forward in this field. Some personal takeaways were the different potential career paths I have. I got the opportunity to work with some of the Forest Service and some people who work with CPW, which are all things I've always been interested in, um, working and moving forward. So getting to talk to them and hearing about their experience was a really wonderful takeaway. I also got to practice professional communication, which is something that I find overwhelming when you're trying to contact people you have a lot of respect for and you know, send that email. And I think that this helped me to really put myself out there and create some of those connections and find professional mentors and learn how best to communicate with them. My recommendation for YVSC is to provide more information on the importance of this project for the sage grouse. I think that's something I've learned going between Colorado and South Carolina is that it doesn't really matter why we do the conservation work that we do. It's just important that it gets done. And I think for a lot of people, climate action is this big, really overwhelming idea that's really hard to um, see as tangible. But I think people find animals as something that they're more inclined to help immediately. And I think that the sage grouse are just this like really cool bird that I think a lot of people would be able to get out there for if they had an understanding of how important these wet meadows are for the sage grouse. And then with that, my other suggestion was that YBSC seek more wildlife related grants um, as a lot of the money for this type of work is held within wild wildlife. Some acknowledgements. I want to thank Jeremiah and Rick with the U.S. Forest Service who were really wonderful in taking me out to California Park and showing me around. I also want to thank Rebecca Burton with NRCS and Pheasants Forever. She helped me figure out 
the exact balance that you have to make between um, depth of detail and the resources you have available to you. And then Dakota Dolan and Michelle Stewart for offering you this opportunity and helping me through it, as well as the summer 2023 internship crew who I've just loved getting to come in every Monday and hear about all the really interesting, cool work that they've been doing. So thank you all for listening. Are there any questions? Great. See? Yes, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Whoops. Thanks for letting me borrow the car. <laughs> I was just I was watching this. Um, the possible connection of your project and maybe Chloe's project with the CSU Extension Office um, for landowners because they do have a program. Um, for new owners of 35 acres or more. And it would be cool to see some of this presented to the new landowners, just like the weeds that we are set with and the, um, um, what else, grasshoppers and just how to care for the land since we a lot of the valley is changing hands. So um, just a, so not really a question, it's kind of a suggestion for YBSC um, with all this great information. Because I know we have spots on our land that we would totally benefit from putting in these crops. Yeah, and I think with that, like the other thing I've been thinking about with that is like kind of similar to the retrofits that Tyler was talking about. Um, this is kind of like the land version of it, like all these natural climate solutions and that me and um, Chloe were talking about. And I think it would be interesting to see if we could potentially find that there is um, money available for people to do this type of thing, because part of it is that you would have to, you know, have the rock hauled in or you'd have to invest in irrigation systems. And I think that that is definitely an investment in the valley and in our land and not just an investment that should fall on the shoulders solely of the landowners. Sammy. I think also the product. Um, CSU extension. Yeah, CSU extension. What about that idea of something like product market to so build a way where it's like clearly beneficial for the people. And so always thinking of like about climate change, you know, I'm saying climate change, I totally agree, but I think for a lot of people, it's way more approachable to say like, this is why it's good for you. And then it's like less politicized and less, more of like doesn't you know trigger this kind of anxiety and stuff like that. So I think that would be really interesting on how you can market it to make it so it benefits the people who are trying to influence it. So. I agree. I think that like that's one thing we've been talking about. Um, me and Ryan have been talking about is like we have been marketing this restoration project one way to everybody when really that's not realistic and that's not what everybody's interested in and. I understand that that is not motivating for everyone. So I think that that's one thing we've been talking about is like, how do you look at a different group of people and you say, okay, like maybe we should give money to the landowners for this because you have vested interest in the health and wellness of the land in Steamboat Springs. And then to the landowners, you have an interest in not having your land be further and further eroded. We have two questions for the people in here. Uh, this one is from Michelle Stewart. Excellent presentation. Do you agree, job of emphasizing the importance of monitoring and tracking the importance of project implementation of the fact? Can you tell us a little bit more about what the monitoring protocol entails? Do you see it as being something that anyone can train to do? For example, climate group volunteers. Yeah, so that's a great question. That was something that me and Ryan talked a lot about is um, who would actually be available to do this. And right now we're not entirely sure. So we could end up getting somebody from the Forest Service who has lots of experience in this, or it could be climate crew volunteers. So when I was developing my monitoring protocol, I developed it under the assumption that it should be something that anybody um, who came off the streets could go into California park and do. And so I had to be really thorough, but also simple in my instructions. So, um, you know, the BLM, when 
you go through their monitoring protocol is really thorough and really interesting, but also assumes a level of understanding of like these different scientific practices, best practices. And I think that um, a big part of mine was like, how do you pare that down to be accessible to anybody? Um, so that looked like, you know, walking through the steps of transect lines and explaining the importance of them and what you're doing, and then really breaking down the different plants in a booklet so you don't need to be an expert on plant identification in order to be doing that in the field. Great presentation, Macy. You're doing a nice job justifying habitat restoration for wildlife conservation via the sagegrass. Sagegrass and sandhill crane are on many of our minds as a community. Do you see opportunities to showcase NCS programs at large through strategic marketing focusing on wildlife? Wondering what else we might do to get the NCS on the consideration. Yeah. I think that wildlife is something that's pretty universal in comparison to a lot of other environmental initiatives. And I think that um, people, like, I mean, people love the cranes <laughs> in Steamboat. And I think that's something we all know. And I think that's true of a lot of the birds here. And I think like, if you look at the um, work that the uh, Colorado Crane Coalition has done, like we are all aware of that now. And they have worked so hard to show us the value of um, those birds and you know, teach kids and teach everybody how cool they are. And I think that's something that would not be hard to do with the sage grouse either, because I think they are a species that um, are undeniably really interesting and really cool. And I think that there's something that, um, there are species that I think we'd love to preserve within Steamboat and have here. And so I think it's a lot about just like getting out there and teaching people about it and making sure people are aware of these species, um, as well as, you know, I think demonstrating how these programs benefit wildlife and not just um, have an impact on carbon, like, because I think both they, they simultaneously are able to do both, but I think there is tends to be different value on those things depending on who you're talking to. Thank you. 